Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Fantastic. It's an honor to be here in your presence. Um, I do welcome all your excellencies who have flown in from the continent of Africa and around the world. Thank you so much for being here at this very important topic that we're about to discuss. So my name is Lady Denta. I'm the founder of Gooba, Grow, Unite, Build Africa. Started about 14 years ago now. Um, and recently, actually, we just celebrated Her Excellency, Her Honourable Patricia Scotland. Um, yes. We honour the Af Africans and Africans on the, in the diaspora and on the continent and bridging that gap. Um, and I wear a lot of hats. So I'm a paediatric nurse by profession. So this topic is very close to my heart. Uh, but also experience, so my auntie was abused by her husband. Um, and I remember growing up, her coming to the house with bruises on her face and never explaining to us why. But we knew why. And I think as children, that's where we need to focus. Because children see all these things, but sometimes we not ask any questions. Um, and I had to then go to my mum. My mum was almost my counsellor, because I was like, why is auntie always coming home with bruises on her face? And then she explained to me what was happening. And I think it's that communication. Some women can't talk about it um, because of the pain that they go through. Um, and so this call to action, um, safeguarding the well-being of women and children, is a very deep topic for myself. Um, so thank you all for making the time to be here. Um, I see there, there are men in the room, which is good. I see some men. So please, let's give a round of applause for the men who are here. Um, I was reading up on, you know, what has happened in terms of number-wise, and the police recorded 1.5 million domestic abuse-related incidents and crimes in the UK um, ending of March 2020. Um, the percentage of repeated cases has also increased by 29.7%. So there's an increase, and I think you know, us coming together to see what we can do is extremely important. I was saying to um, Right Honourable Patricia Scotland that I was there in Rwanda when this conversation started. And with Dr. Fatima, I remember your, your speech as well when the First Ladies event. Um, and I'm glad that we are continuing the conversation because sometimes we start these conversations and then nothing happens. We don't follow up. And so I'm so glad that we're back here together to have continue the conversation and see what we can do. So that's a little bit about me um, and my organization. We have our Google Foundation that looks at autism. So I saw that one of the speakers, um, you look at autism as well, which is a big stigma in our community. Um, one of our um, topics is I'm not your stigma. Um, that's our thing for um, the foundation. And so I have the privilege and the honor to actually introduce my mentor um, to the stage. And, I, you know, when I was like, I was like, oh, we honoured this woman, but how am I going to introduce her? She's like somebody that inspires me. She's, a, you know, she's the 10th born of 12 children, the first in 700 years to be an attorney general for Her Majesty. And we are so proud of you for everything that you achieved and everything that you stand for. Thank you so much. And please give a round of applause for quite a good
is a sign that we are determined that there will be change. And the scourge of violence against women and against girls has to stop. And I'd like you just to look around to see who you are sitting here. Because we have women of every race, every color, every religion, every demographic, and they have come together. We have all to come together with one purpose. And this call to action is not only going to be part of the fruit that was sown in Rwanda, it's going to be a seminal moment that people will look back and say, the fight back started here. And let's be very clear, every person in this room, including all the wonderful men, and I want to shout out to all the wonderful men who happen to be with us, because they're going to help us to be change makers. And guess what? We're going to hold them all to account. So maybe the men should just stand up for <laughs>
not on my watch. When I took over, there was one in four women in this country who were subjected to domestic violence. The cost of domestic violence was 23 billion a year, economic cost. And we were determined to change it. And we came up with a holistic approach to dealing with domestic violence. And guess what? It worked. It took determination, it took policy, it took working with government, local government, foundations, businesses, individuals, it took all of us, but it worked. And by 2010, when I left government, we reduced domestic violence by 64%, and we had saved 7.1 billion pounds per annum. government makes no difference, we showed it did. But guess what? If you take off your foot from the pedal, when I left in 2010, it had gone from one in four women to one in six women. One in ten men. Uh, and those figures were great. But where are we today? Here. We're no longer one in six women. I think we're back to one in 2.5. And so we know just as it can get better, it can get worse. If you take your foot off the pedal for a nanosecond, it gets worse. So what we've done in the Commonwealth is create, with Commonwealth says no more, a holistic program which, if implemented, will be the difference we need to make. But it's, once again, going to take all of us. So this is my call to action to every single person present today. And I want us all to claim this. We can do this. Do you hear me? Yes. We can. We can do this. We can do this. We can do this. We can do this. And we're going to. And it starts today. I'm going to repeat again. We can do this. Absolutely, we can do this. And together, we are stronger, right? We can't do it individually. But when we come together as a community, as people, as one, we can definitely do it. We can do it. Um, next up, we have a keynote speaker, um, Dr. Fatima Bio, Her Excellency, the First Lady of Sierra Leone. Um, my husband's actually from Sierra Leone. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and as I, as I mentioned, um, I was in Rwanda. I heard her speaking about Hands Off Our Girls, which is a big campaign in Sierra Leone, the impact that she's made for young girls. Um, and it's just an honor and a privilege to have you back here to continue this conversation and for us to fight together. Please welcome Dr. Fatima Bia, Her Excellency. Thank you. So my husband is from Sierra Leone, which makes her my wife. <laughs> Chairperson, the Secretary General of the Commonwealth, right, Honorable Patricia Scotland, Casey, my dear sisters, first ladies from Zanzibar and the Gambia, distinguished guests, good morning to you all. Come on, it's not that depressing. <laughs> good morning. Good morning. I bring you all warm greetings from the women and girls of Sierra Leone. And when I say warm, I mean warm. The weather is totally different. You know, please permit me to register my thanks and appreciation to the Right Honorable Patricia Scotland and the Commonwealth Secretariat for inviting me to deliver the keynote address for this event. 
The theme coin for this occasion, a call for action safeguarding the well-being of women and children, is very apt and the timing is exact for the call to action. I believe we are gathered here to address the identified factors related to violence against women and girls, and at the same time, pinpoint the strategic action, including evidence-based best practice from within us in the Commonwealth. As diverse as the Commonwealth is, with a membership of 56 countries spanning across five continents, and with a population of more than 2.5 billion from which are the major races, languages, religions, and culture of the world. That notwithstanding, the related factor on violence against women and girls are more almost the same. The statistics are horrible, and they are constantly remind us of the moment task ahead. Daring to challenge this established and chronic menace in our society that have been entrenched in the name of culture, tradition, and norms that only subsist to perpetuate violence against women and girls in a very courageous move that some of us has devoted our lives to. In this 21st century, we are still having within our community very harmful male dominance behaviors in domestic violence against mothers and their daughters. Our communities are placed where women and girls are considered inferior and not significant. Access to factors of production, especially land and capital, as well as employment opportunities, remain very restrictive for women and girls in our community. Even more depressing is the continuous existence of barriers to get to gender equality that are expressed in discriminatory laws in major part of our communities within the Commonwealth family. I want to take this opportunity to talk about the Hands of Our Girls campaign. In 2018, when I became the First Lady of the Republic of Sierra Leone, I immediately initiated one of the most aggressive and holistic campaigns against sexual and gender-based violence that was rife and very disgusting Girls as young as six months old were raped. Girls were leaving school due to perceived child marriage. Children were trafficked. Menstruation was keeping girls out of school. HIV and AIDS were on the rise. Victims of rapes and SGVV did not access justice easily. Even more depressing for me was the complacency and participation of our communities and religious and traditional leaders as well as the influent, the affluent and the important people in our, in our society, politicians, the rich, and the people in position of power. These were people that I wanted to teach a lesson. Our immediate intervention of the Hands of Our Girls campaign were declaring a state of emergency on rape and reviewing the Sexual Offenses Act of 2012, launching an aggressive <coughs> nationwide campaign including name-calling of perpetrators, imams, pastors, bike riders, politicians, and some high-profile um, citizens, which we took to the length and breadth of the entire country. We also publicly decorated the communities and traditional leaders as champions of hands of our girls. In addition, we established specialized structures, one-stop centers, and the Nova Sexual Offenses Model Court, amongst others, for easy access to justice and review penalties for perpetrators. We also went on further to review the governance structure. We now have a standalone ministry for gender and children's affairs so that we can be more responsive to women and girls issue. And I'm very honored to say my Minister of Ch Gender and Children Affairs is here to support this cause now. Following that, we targeted the policy and the laws that act as impediments to the en en emancipation and empowerment of women and girls in Sierra Leone. Alongside all of this was the deliberate investment we made as a nation 
which, which helps from the vision of His Excellency the President, retired Brigadier Julius Madabio. In his campaign to the people of Sierra Leone for leadership, he promised human capital development with free quality education for all as the flagship program in the medium term national development plan for 2019 to 2023. The Hands of Our Girls campaign further implemented and we complemented the government's efforts with free sanitary pads to ensure girls do not miss school during menstruation, but even more important breakthrough of breaking the taboo and dismystifying menstruation and menstrual hygiene in our conversation in schools and homes. Keep out of our national effort, key out of our national efforts worthy of considering as evidence-based best practice include, but not limited to, the reduced infant and maternity uh, uh, maternal mortality as observed by the WHO by 60%. So in less than five years, we have managed to reduce our infant and child mortality rate by 60%. The sexual offenses... <laughs> the sexual offenses model court, a specialized division of the High Court of Sierra Leone now and envy in the sub-region. Sierra Leone have a special court that only sits to, to judge cases that involve um, sexual abuse and all rape issues in Sierra Leone. The Reverse Sexual Offenses Act of 2019 from 2012, a standalone ministry for gender and children's affairs dedicated to advancing women and girls' issue, the free quality education for all boys and girls in Sierra Leone with school materials and feeding, a free sanitary pad for all school going girls, free tuition from primary to university for girls opting to study science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, STEM, the passing of the landmark law, the Gender Equality and Women Empowerment Give it Act of 2022. We have now entrenched in our laws that women should have the same opportunity as men in every aspect of life and we continue to progressively empower them to enjoy these rights. In the current parliament and cabinet in Sierra Leone, we can boast of at least 30% membership in all government positions. Internationally, we can also boast of the adoption of two UN resolutions, access to justice for rape victims and the UN World Day November 18 for the prevention of and healing from victims of child sexual exploitation and violence. There are several positive and remarkable achievements recorded over the years, including the high confidence of women and girls in our communities nowadays. There is now fear, there is now fear in the perpetrators. When perpetrators see girls under the age of 18, they call them Fatima's children. And, uh, and our, sentencing, our sentencing now is harsh. Before the Hands of Our Girls campaign, when you rape a girl in Sierra Leone, the maximum you get in prison is four months. Today, the minimum you get is 15 years. The legal framework, the legal framework for women participation in political and other leadership positions, among others, are all developmental, we are proud of. Even though we can catalog the above mentioned as good or very good progress, we are not going to rest and say we are satisfied. We need to push harder to cement the progress made at the same time, continue to pursue the clearing of the remaining barriers and other impediments so that together, we can counter and eliminate violence against women and girls. Before I conclude my speech, I would like to leave with you the following messages which we all should consider in our call for action. Recognition and amplification of women's contribution. Women have been mostly restricted from decision making, income generation, and access to the required resources needed to make them self-reliance. Let us always recognize and amplify progress made and success recorded by women over the years to serve as a benchmark for setting our next target. 
deliberate investment in research to further understand why even when we are making all this effort, our progress is painstakingly slow in curbing violence against women and girls. Let's build sustainable relationship through networking and sustainable partnership at local and international levels. We should and must communicate as well as report at various levels and audiences on best practices with empirical data and information to help us monitor, evaluate, and learn. We must ensure inclusive and participation of all stakeholders in our various efforts to liberate women. Coordination of all our efforts with our government is very important so that all our initiatives and intervention can be captured in the National Development Plan and sub-regional agenda. This will help streamline our collective efforts and at the same time minimize duplication so that we can derive maximum impact from our collective effort. We must adopt and include climate change mitigation in all that we do. The world is facing existential threats due to climate change and as women, we must be at the forefront of environmental protection because the effect of climate change such as extreme drought, flooding and global warming disproportionately affect us, mostly. I remain convinced and fervently that believes that continuous engagement to share experience and learning from each other in the Commonwealth and even beyond the Commonwealth as our collective action is the sure way of safeguarding the well-being of women and girls in the world today. As I take my seat, please permit me to appreciate all those individuals and groups like the No More Foundation, as well as other partners that have supported the Commonwealth over the years in the, in the capturing of positive partnership and fruitful results for ending violence against women and girls. When we leave here today, let's not leave and say well, the job is done. Let us believe that this is the beginning because every day in a woman's life is the, is the first day for progress. Together we can, together we should, and together we must. We must change the narrative for women. This has been going on for far too long and it is time to say no more. Thank you. Are you not inspired? Are you not gingered up? I'm gingered up and I'm gingered up because she's making, she's made impact in her turn. Real impact. From somebody being able to go to jail for four months to 15 years, that's impact. Reducing everything to 60%, that's impact. For people to even call young girls under the age of 18, Fatima's girls, that's impact. Your legacy, what you have done, that's legacy. Thank you so much for the work that you've done. I think she deserves another round of applause. <laughs> We're going to have a short video now um, by the UN Deputy Secretary General, Her Excellency Amina Ahmed, Mama Mohammed. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me to speak at the Commonwealth event on the safety and well-being of women and children. Violence against women, youth and children, especially adolescent girls, remains alarmingly high in private, public and virtual spaces. Each year, 245 million women and girls worldwide experience physical and or sexual violence, with 176 million children under the age of five living with a mother who is a victim of intimate partner violence. Violence against women and girls in the digital context is also on the rise. Offline and online violence has enduring mental health implications on women and children. Long-term psychological effects include post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety, and low self-esteem, which often impacts overall family life, performance at work, and at school. Excellencies, the interconnectedness between violence against women and children is evident. They share risk factors and consequences rooted in social norms that condone violent discipline, promote harmful masculinities, blame survivors, and perpetuate gender inequality. This cycle must be broken. Violence against women and children can be prevented, and we know what works. 
A comprehensive approach is vital, addressing legislative gaps, amplifying prevention efforts, engaging men and boys to foster positive social norms, and ensuring access to quality response and support services. Action must include capacity building for frontline workers who provide specialized services to women and children, the police, school staff, medical personnel, and community leaders. Excellencies, the United Nations works closely with sister agencies and partners to identify integrated approaches to address violence against women and children in advocacy, policy, and the programming spaces at the global and country levels. Initiatives in countries like Vietnam, Nigeria, Uganda, Timor-Leste, and Cambodia focus on education and social norm change interventions to address underlying risk factors for violence against women and children. Failure to effectively address violence against women and children hinders our progress towards achieving the SDGs by 2030. It's a crucial challenge that demands our attention and concerted efforts. I congratulate the Commonwealth Secretariat for organizing this important day of discussion, analysis, and sharing of knowledge and experience. Let's work together to safeguard the well-being of all women and children by being bold in our actions, developing clear policies, and ensuring dedicated support. We know we can create a safer, more equitable future for all where no one is left behind. Thank you.
destroy us as women, as people, as societies, without really meaning to, because we as women are nurturers, we want peace. And in order to um, in, ensure peace, we don't take the kind of actions or we don't take the leadership uh, that we need to. So hearing about the changes in, in the legal framework and procedures in Sierra Leone is really heartwarming and so encouraging. It, th those are the kind of changes we need in many of our countries because the repercussions are not strong enough to make a difference and they, it really needs to be change. Um, so mental health promotion and prevention interventions um, that we need, they have to be aimed to strengthen an individual's capacity to regulate emotions, enhance alternatives to risk-taking behaviors, build resilience for managing difficult situations and adversity, and promote supportive social environments and social networks. Globally, one out of every seven children between the ages of 10 to 19 years experience a mental disorder. And many of it is from experiences that they have had, whether witnessing it or experience violence themselves. This is approximately 13% of the global burden of disease in this age group. So imagine what those children are as adults when at such a young age they've experienced violence. Depression, anxiety, and behavioral disorders are among the leading causes of illness and disability among adolescents, and we still have no solutions, truly, to prevent it. Alarmingly, suicide is the fourth leading cause of death among 15 to 29-year-olds. There is no doubt that mental health is an essential part of children's overall health, and it has a complex, interactive relationship with their physical health and their ability to succeed at school, work, and in society. So when we talk about economic development, by ignoring mental health and support for mental health, we are actually preventing economic development in our countries. There's no doubt that mental health is an essential part of children's overall health, and it has a complex, oh, sorry, <laughs> it's important to remember that mental health is important throughout childhood, from prenatal consideration all the way through transitions to adulthood. Ensuring mental health of uh, a young girl as well as when she is a pregnant woman and then taking care of her during uh, postnatal months is essential. We often forget about postpartum depression in many of our caregiving uh, programs for health. Not only is depression the leading cause of disability, it is reported to be twice as common in women than in men. Discrimination, gender-based violence, poverty, and the pressure of multiple roles are among the most cited risk factors that contribute to poor mental health among women. Women impacted by mental illness, disability, or refugee status are among society's most vulnerable groups. Women with disabilities, including those with mental illnesses, are often excluded from the decision-making process regarding the treatment they will receive. And that is, it's wonderful that many of us are willing to speak up about it and are involved in this process, but we need many more. We need to hear about the women who actually face those challenges, who face the barriers to services, and uh, can tell us where are the gaps, where, what needs to change. It's, it's the attitudes, women without the resources to really speak up who experience it daily. Such women can also experience significant social exclusion, marginalization, and stigma. This has other repercussions, including reduced help seeking, deprivation of dignity and human rights, and threats to ill health, well-being, and quality of life. Nurturing mental health doesn't just improve our daily functioning, but it can also help us control or at least combat some of the physical health problems directly linked to mental health conditions. And mental health conditions, when left untreated, perpetuate not just the woman or the immediate family, but they continue from one generation on to the next. Positive mental health is crucial as it profoundly influences every aspect of our lives. It can impact and improve our thoughts, actions, and interactions. 
It empowers us to navigate challenges, build meaningful relationships, and make informed decisions. I'm glad to be here discussing the vital issue with you today, and I hope we leave here with greater determination to each do whatever we can to address and improve the mental health and well-being of our children and of our fellow women in our societies. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Mental health is a big thing, um, especially looking at what's happening in the world today. Uh, from COVID, loss of jobs, people are not allowed to go out, from wars. There's so many things that are happening that are affecting our mental health. How do we balance? I was talking to Mr. Nabil. How do we balance? How do we balance? There's so much going on. So much going on. And this leads on to Maya. Um, and Maya is, is, is inspiring because she's only 20. Um, and it's nice to have a balance of young people, older generation, coming together to have this topic so we can get a perspective of everything. And the reason why she's kind of geared towards her is because her brother has autism. Um, and as I mentioned before, autism is a big part of our foundation. And, and, and even with young people who have disability, who are going through these things, how do we, how do we get the communication out there? It's difficult, right? They could be going through things, but we might not know, because some of them cannot communicate it to us. And so it's great to have your perspective. She is a Commonwealth, and let me get your title right. I need to big you up because it's important. She is the Commonwealth Young Person of the Year. From Trinidad and Tobago. Did I get the accent right? Yeah. Please welcome um, Maya Nanam. She is the Commonwealth Young Leader of the Person. The year. So she's going to give us a perspective um, and allies and friends and families' roles in supporting disabled young people. Please give her a round of applause. Your Excellencies, distinguished persons and guests, good morning. I want to thank the Honourable Patricia Scotland and the Commonwealth Secretariat for the invitation to be here this morning and Ms. Sultana Alfred to speak for and the Wish Foundation to sponsor my trip. It is often said that it takes a village to raise a child, and an even bigger village to raise a child with a disability. Imagine a situation where a woman or a 15-year-old girl are at the developmental age of a 3-year-old. They don't understand danger, they don't understand the concept of personal space, they don't know how to take care of themselves, and therefore they are at a risk of high abuse. At Raoul's Clubhouse, the autism center that my NGO opened last year, we interact with women and children diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder who are always at a high risk of abuse and violence because of their intellectual and emotional challenges. The women and children who access intervention services at Raoul's Clubhouse are not only ones who the women and children with other disabilities are also at risk. In my country, Trinidad and Tobago, 4% of the total population are persons living with a disability, and the numbers are increasing. According to the 2011 census, there are more females living with a disability. In fact, Females account for 50.2% of the population of persons with disabilities. Children with disabilities comprise of 1% of the total population of children. Persons with disabilities are at a higher risk of violence and abuse. Persons with disabilities are also often overlooked in the development and implementation of policy. In-depth consideration is not given to their special needs as it relates to safety and safeguarding. In my work at Raoul's Clubhouse, it is clear that the first point for safeguarding persons with disabilities comes from the family and friends. 
in the absence of effective implementation of legislation to address the challenges faced by persons with disabilities. It is the parents, caregivers, siblings, and friends who are the ones who play an important role in enabling and addressing safety and well-being. It is the village that plays the initial key role in supporting that. These allies are the ones who advocate for those who can't advocate for themselves. In my case, I use my voice to speak for my 19-year-old brother who is non-verbal. He may not be able to express himself verbally, but I understand him completely. I know when he is not comfortable in a situation or a place, and I know when he is on the brink of having a meltdown or if he is in a situation where he feels unsafe. Thus, I am in a position to protect him and look out for him. Drawing from my experience with Raul, my NGO Autism Siblings and Friends Network provides support to parents and caregivers and trained siblings so that they can also understand and protect those with disabilities who are in their care. As my brother's keeper, I wanted to widen the village and create a group of allies, so I include my friends in my advocacy work. Thus, I train youth volunteers to advocate for inclusion. The result has been amazing. Today, we have a network of autism youth leaders who come together to create opportunities for persons with disabilities in a safe environment. We create safe spaces for them and we use our voices to advocate for inclusion. It is only eight years since I started my NGO, but the village is growing stronger and as allies, friends and families are becoming empowered. The education and training we provide for all parents, siblings, and volunteers emphasize safeguarding. My experiences with my brother, the fact that I need to know that he is safe at all times, has really pushed me to focus on the safeguarding of all persons at Browse Clubhouse. With the support of the Queen's Commonwealth Trust, we have developed and implemented strict safeguarding policies and procedures. I would like to see this kind of focus coming from all agencies that work with women and children. For this to happen, we need to be mindful of the special safeguarding needs of persons like my brother and others with disabilities. Thus, the role of allies, friends, and families playing their lives must not be taken for granted. It is imperative that they are given the support they need to safeguard those with disabilities who are in their care. Educational campaigns, funding for training and development, and research are just some areas that need immediate action. Safeguarding women and children with disabilities has to be a priority area as we work towards reducing violence and abuse in our world. Thank you. Eight, only eight years. Eight years is a long time. You've done really, really well. Another round of applause for her. We're going to have the Commonwealth um, Says No More champion video. This conversation coincides with the opening of the 13th Commonwealth Women's Affairs Minister's Meeting which is being held in Nassau, the Bahamas, from the 21st to the 23rd of August, 2023, under the theme, Equality Towards a Common Future. Well, thank you all so much for being here. It is very, very exciting and such a pleasure to be able to have this dialogue. So, because the Commonwealth has always been one of the most trenchant advocates for equality, for inclusivity, it was a scar on us all that this violence against women and girls was not being sufficiently concretely and collectively addressed because every country in our commonwealth had committed itself to end violence against women and girls and every country was working hard on it but the difference i think is we all believed that we could work harder if we worked together in partnership and it's this partnership which has been so important. What do you think are the challenges that your country particularly faces, um, perhaps different from others, perhaps same? 
Uh, yes, there are a few that I can mention here. Uh, one of them is uh, violence within the family and some of our family islands. We are an archipelagic nation. We have at least 30 countries, 30 islands at least, in And that makes it very difficult to keep track of everything that's happening on every island, to gather information and everything else, and also treat uh, abused victims. And information gathering is a problem. Uh, in that because of that, the violence within the family, particularly against women and children, is like an open secret that happens in some of these family islands. And it's been like that for so many years. So we need a cultural shift, totally, to help eradicate this program. It has to be seriously addressed, which is what we're doing in our new bill. That's one of our challenges because of all the islands we inhabit. What are some of the challenges that you see uh, in Sri Lanka? Uh, in Sri Lanka, I would say one of the biggest challenges is uh, people's mindsets. And I don't mean the mindsets of the abusers alone. I'm talking about um, um, society that refuses to take the phenomenon seriously. I'm talking about victims and survivors who are compelled to stay in relationships for various reasons, whether it's economic or familial or insecurity or whatever it is, and stay on until violence sometimes escalates into femicide. So we want to eliminate mm -hmm. domestic and sexual violence from our world. Because if we do that, it will benefit not just the women and girls, but our men also will have a safer world, a better world. We've said that there cannot be peace in our world until we have peace in our homes. So this peace in our home initiative, through what we will do as a Commonwealth family, I hope we will be in the pathfinders for all of us. session, the first session, um, I've learned a lot. Um, what I've learned is that policy works. When you have good policies, uh, we can reduce the amount of domestic violence. When um, Right Honourable Patricia Scotland spoke, she spoke about how it was costing 24 billion, 24 billion pounds, and she reduced that by seven, and it went to 7.1 billion. Yeah, we reduced it by 7.1 7 billion. These are impacts. Um, and then also looking at how do we get people with disability, how do we control that, how do we engage them to know the signs that they're being abused? Because they're, they're, they're at very high risk, very high risk. Um, capacity building for frontline workers, um, how do we, engage them, how do we make sure that they can see people that coming in. I mean, as a nurse, we I saw loads of um, people that came in, especially the women who were abused, that you could see. Um, and it's silent abuse as well. Uh, silently, you could tell that these women were abused. So I'm just going to ask two other people in the room what they learned from the first session. Because I know you, you want to hear the chairs persons, but I've said mine, and now I want to hear from you. Just two people. Any any hands, or do I just go to somebody? Anybody want to say something? What has? Yes. Again, very similar. What I've learned is the amount of projects going on in the Commonwealth. And I think today is the day for us to share. This is what I will take back. The sharing of initiatives possibly to talk more, to get deeper into it. What were the logistics? What were the challenges met? And how did they overcome the challenges? Because we all come from different parts of the Commonwealth with different, um, I can I say, adversities we're facing. 
So for me, it's to learn from those who've spoken about the logistics behind it. And how did they overcome the challenges? Fantastic. And I think we're going to be having panel sessions, so hopefully we're going to dive into this a bit more. I'll go to my left. Thank you, great. I think I learned that um, if we work together as one people, I've learned that if we work together as one people, women and men together, all ages, all communities, then we can do it. And you know, we're just one people with their own planet, so it should work for us. Yeah. I'll go to the men. One, and I know he's looking at me because we were having a conversation earlier. So I'll go to you. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm thinking uh, I'm a, a son first, um, and also a husband, and also a dad, so I think um, I've taken that up with me. And, and also, as a member of the FCDO, uh, we have a kind of a mould in terms of the policy side of it, but, uh, and it's also interesting, kind of the project side of thing. We, we are working with the Congresec and also other kind of common partners, so there's lots of great things going on, but obviously we can we can definitely do more. I'll go to the back here. Um, it's very nice to see everybody coming together today to talk about a very important topic. Um, we come from Qatar and uh, we're here to uh, learn from everybody and uh, uh, hopefully also do a big change in our country. Thank you. All the way from Qatar. I'll go to the next. Oh, yes. This is why I like you, Nabil. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I think a very important takeaway for me in the first session is that leadership matters. Mm -hmm. And leadership is not limited to one particular country, to one particular organization, to one particular sector. Mm -hmm. So we have a great example of intergovernmental leadership. We have a fantastic example from the national leadership. We have an excellent example from the community leadership. And also, uh, Samia also talked about the sectoral leadership from sectoral leadership. So for me, this is the takeaway that leadership at every level will make that change. Do you all agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I think he deserves a round of applause. I'm going to go to the other side because I feel like I'm just going to this side. Oh, yes, the man wants to say something. This is great. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, what I found in this first session is that uh, uh, policy is very important. Uh, secondly, uh, combating this uh, violence against women is a journey. It is a journey uh, that we can easily reach the destination if we work together. Thirdly, it is the, the, the family law. Uh, the, the young lady of the year uh, said it takes a village to raise a key. It is not one person is valid to carry, but if we carry it all together, it will be lighter. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. I'll go to the side. I'll go to another man. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Nadia prevent uh, violence against women and girls as a, as, as a road towards achieving the SDGs. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. A round of applause to everybody for your contribution. So this shows that everybody was listening. This is great. This is fantastic. Okay. Next up we have a panel discussion. And I would like to introduce the moderator, Jude Kelly, CBE, who is the founder and chair of the Woe Foundation. Judy, 